This episode of the Peep Show podcast is sponsored by Quick and Dirty Media. Are you an independent content creator, webcam model, or clip maker? Quick and Dirty Media can help you with your video editing and production needs at a reasonable price, allowing you to devote more time to creating your content. As a special offer for Peep Show podcast listeners, the first five content creators who submit a video for editing will receive their first order free. Make sure to use the promo code PeepshowPod. Find Quick and Dirty Media on Twitter at Quick Dirty Media or send an email to info at quickanddirtymedia.com. Quick and Dirty Media is proud to be an adult friendly business. Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. News and stories from the sex industry. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Welcome back to another episode of the Peep Show podcast. This week we get to talk to award winning cam model, clip artist, and cosplayer Princess Purple. She talks to us about her transition from nursing to sex work, how she connects with the characters she plays, her extensive dildo collection, and our long friendship outside of sex work. But first, a message from one of our sponsors. I'm Adrian, one of the hosts of After Adult Podcast. My porn name should be Mozart Fremont, but you probably know me better by my actual porn name, Siri. I'm Rachel, but my porn name would be Woody 16th Avenue. <laughs> After Adult is a podcast about life and porn. I don't actually watch porn. I don't really watch that much porn either. I probably watch more than you, but I mean, most of the time it kind of would feel like going to work on my day off. You 100% watch more than me because I don't watch porn. (laughs) Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for After Adult. Or visit afteradult.com and follow us on Instagram at afteradult. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Peep Show podcast. Welcome. We have been busy. I feel like we say that every single week. Uh, we probably do, or we have been recently, <laughs> but it's true. We have been pouring so much into building our new magazine-style website, as well as throwing ourselves fully back into the podcast. Yeah, that... it's been so exciting, though. Yeah, it's been awesome, uh, and we've been using our, you know, all of our COVID self-quarantining time to really pour all of our energy into these projects and it's been really cool we've met so many cool people we've uh, got some great writing pouring in Uh, there's so much going on and we're really excited about it but also it's the middle of the night and we're kind of exhausted (laughs) that's that's a lie okay i'm not that exhausted actually i'm (laughs) drinking coffee i'm ready to put in like another five hours of work on the website but jesse i want to go to bed (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> PJ's a night owl and I want to work in the morning and we have this really difficult time trying to like find overlapping times that we're both awake and able to work so yeah. well, but here like we are it's like a tag team effort so anyways we have a exciting interview for you today with one of our very best friends not just in the industry but just in life in general mm-hmm But before we do that, uh, maybe we should give you a little heads up on specifically what's going on this week on the site. One of the things that I'm excited about is that on the new website that we're building, we had last week our first ever articles and reviews written by people that aren't us on the website. Yeah. So Peep Show Media is expanding. So on Friday, we published a bondage gear review that Courtney Trouble and Pan Ellington created with really amazing pictures. So you should check that out. And on Saturday, Reese Piper, a Brooklyn-based stripper, wrote an article about the strip club's reopening, and we're really proud of that, so you should also check that out. And um, in addition to those two pieces, a piece that I wrote on um, my experience doing online sex work came out, and that was actually originally published in a publication called The Doe, but I republished it here. And lastly, but most importantly... We put together a dildo and costume matching game uh, to promote 
Princess Burple being on this episode. Yeah, that's so cute. You all need to go and check it out and try to match up the dildos with the costumes. I was very proud of my (laughs) non-programming skills, but (laughs) my ability to use random WordPress blocks to make a fun little game. Yeah. I'm excited about a new project that I'm starting, too, that's going to be inaugurated this week. Um, Inaugurated? Yeah. We're going to break a bottle of champagne over the website, (laughs) right over this computer model, computer monitor. Okay, I am excited. Don't make light of my excitement. I had an idea, a spark of inspiration. I'm going to put out a series of interviews. I have been putting out interviews of sex workers, but most of them have been focused on different aspects of their sex work careers. I wanted to put out a series of interviews of sex workers where they're talking about things that are not sex work. So I'm calling this new series series when we're not hustling and the first one is going to come out this week and i'm interviewing the lovely melody kush and what are you going to talk about with melody kush i will let that be a surprise Ooh, it's a mystery (laughs) she does something interesting that you all want to know about and that's what's exciting about this series right is that you're drawing out these different dimensions of sex workers that maybe we don't know about or don't always get to see in public. Yeah, you know, as somebody who's a sex worker who's done a lot of media interviews, I find that I'm always asked to comment on and speak on sex work. And there's so many other things that, you know, me and my fellow sex workers do when they're not hustling. So, so yeah. When they're not hustling. When they're, when we're not, when we're not hustling. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about that. So the first one's going to come out this week. Well, that is great. I'm looking forward to it. I love Mel Kush. <laughs> and I also love Princess Burple. Let's go ahead and bring you our interview. Sounds good. Let's get to it. Here at the Peep Show podcast, we talk a lot about supporting sex workers. And one way you can support sex workers is by paying for your porn. In the spirit of Pride Month, why not take this opportunity to support a trans-owned and operated queer porn collective? Trouble Films offers a wealth of different kinds of porn and erotica. We love it, and we know you will too. Go visit them and check out their films on TroubleFilms.com or on sites like PinkLabel.tv or Hot Movies. We're here today with Princess Burple. Welcome, Princess Burple. Hi. We have been looking forward to having you on. We're really excited to have you here to talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I actually got involved in a Twitter conversation about that. They were complaining that the Cardassians weren't very complex. Wait, and I what? was very upset about it. <laughs> exactly. Like, what are you talking about? Of course they are. <laughs> I, <laughs> they were profoundly complex, right? I know. Even Ducat, as evil as he was. Right. I mean, and his silly. His evilness and campy, was complex. But it was complex. Yeah, right. There was like a, a, a trajectory there. And my God, Garrick is, I mean, among <laughs> my favorite Star Trek characters of all time. I know. I, he yeah. is like evil... But also at the same time, like there's a certain lovableness about him. And, you know, as a, as a nerd, I appreciate his lust for culture and, you know, the general Cardassian celebration of, of, of culture. So you guys aren't talking about the Kardashians. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke, though. That is like a big joke. You're talking and about the that... Kardashians? What? No, no, it, no H. Cardassians. There you go. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so I've only been with PJ for six years, but I've never uh, watched this. Nevertheless, we have above our desk like, an enormous picture of something that's related to Star Trek. That's, that's a good description. <laughs> yeah. I actually, um, my friend got me a the script of the very last episode of DS9. And I, when I like got it, I just sobbed so much because it was right after um, the character or the actor who oh, plays Odo right. died. Yeah. And I got it and I just burst into tears, like sobbing uncontrollably because oh. <laughs> he he loved playing that character so much. 
that he um, would sign every single signature, every single autograph with a bucket of Odo's bucket. (laughs) He would draw it and put Odo on the bucket. In case you uh, listeners and uh, Jesse don't know what we're talking about. (laughs) Mainly uh, (laughs) Jesse. Odo was a a shapeshifter. Okay. And uh, at least early in the series, I I can't remember, things change over time, but he had uh, difficulty maintaining his solid form for a prolonged period of time. And so he would have to rest uh, in liquid form in a bucket. Oh, interesting. And in case you don't know what DS9 is, um, he's also the actor who played the father in MASH. Mm. Oh, really? Is that right? Yeah. Huh. And he passed away last year. Oh. At the end of last year. Okay. So. so this is not, I mean, this is probably clear to anyone who's listening to this. This is not the first time you two have talked about DS9. <laughs> oh, God, no. I try to send PJ messages all the time and they get left on red. I'm about- sorry. <laughs> <laughs> PJ is the worst at answering messages. Yeah, I thought I was bad. <laughs> no, he's I am serious. really tremendously he's so bad, bad that his ex girlfriends send me messages when they're trying to get in touch with him. I, I'm just really introverted, and I have a hard. My problem is, is I'm not. I can't like multitask with social interactions, and so like stuff will come up on my phone, but it's just like too overwhelming for me to respond to in the moment while I'm like working mm-hmm. on stuff. And then, unfortunately, like a lot of the times, I forget that you know I was like mentally bookmark. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna respond to this later, and then I just forget. Um, <laughs> It's... I'm honestly the same way. And then it like gets too long that I feel awkward responding right. after like a month or so of not responding. So I just pretend like it didn't happen. Right. Or <laughs> I'll go to message that person like a month later, you know, because I really like them and care about them and want to talk to them. And then I realize that I didn't respond to their message. And so then I'll just like not talk to them at all forever because... Oh my God. Because yeah. because now it's just too awkward. That's and... not the right answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> the right answer to that when you're like, oh, I'm really thinking about Burple. I wonder how she's doing. And then you're like, shit, a month ago she messaged me about DS9. <laughs> then what you're supposed to do is say, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry. How are you doing? And let's talk about DS9. Yeah, yeah. I, I figured that out by like age Wait. 30. So is this like a therapy session for PJ? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it is. It's a it's a life skills and learning uh, workshop. I'll like go by his computer though, and he'll have his email address open, and like half of his emails aren't open, and I can't understand that at all. I'm like that as well. Are you really? I can't do that. Any message I, I get, am. like the second I get it, I need to know what it says. In the middle of conversations, actually. So in the middle of sentences. So she'll get a message and she'll be like, so yeah, I was thinking we should go to... And then like three minutes of silence. I go back and forth. I do that. But then I also just like leave everything on like unread. Yeah. And I don't even look at it because I can't. I'm like too overwhelmed. Yeah. But on my personal email, I probably have like 8,000 unread messages. (laughs) Most of it's spam, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we should say that we um we knew each other before any of us were in sex work, which is so wild. I think you're the only person from this world that I know from outside of this world. Everybody else I met here. Yeah. Well, I think technically I was in sex work, but I just wasn't purple yet. Right. Yeah, and I think I didn't know about it for a while. I think that's the same. I mean, I think I had probably, well, I mean, I was doing some sex work before I met you, Jesse. Yeah. So certainly before I met Burple. But we all knew each other for quite a long time before we were like, wait, so you're <laughs> on many vids? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't remember how exactly that went, but I do remember debating in my mind whether or not I was going to tell Jesse. Yeah. Because I I'm always just very cautious about that sort of yeah. thing. I've told people that I've known and they get kind of creepy or they yeah. get kind of weird or they're like 
will tell me what website you're on so I don't accidentally come across and it's like, uh, is that really why you want to know the website that I'm on? <laughs> right, right. Can you tell me the exact URL <laughs> of your profile page so I don't accidentally type it in? Yeah, what's your stage name? Because like, I would hate to come across that accidentally <laughs> while masturbating. Right. Right. Can you just show me your tits right now so I'll recognize them if I accidentally come across them on <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm just very cautious about that. I don't even remember having a conversation. I think there was a time that I didn't know. And then there was a time that I did. And I don't remember that transition at all. I don't either. It uh, Maybe it was just so organic that right. it doesn't really strike me. Well, I do I do remember the cautiousness that I held. Like, yeah. Is it something I can tell Jesse? Is it not? But I obviously I came to the conclusion that it was and it went great and we're wonderful <laughs> friends and you're just like a very thoughtful person. And PJ, I think I knew that you personally were involved. in. Yeah, because I was interviewing sex workers already at the time, which, you know, obviously was rooted in my own experience. But I also didn't talk about it a lot for the same the same reasons. It's hard to know with the stigma. And plus, I mean, we had not been outed to my family yet at the time, which, you know, was a not so pleasant Those were the process. Days. But Those were the days. On the other <laughs> hand, at least we're on the other side of that now. So, but yeah, I remember a bit, and I don't know if you're willing to talk about the work that you used to do, but at the time you were working a full-time job. And oh, yeah. I was a nurse for several years and it overlapped with my sex work a lot. You know, to me, it was just wild because you were working like an insane amount during that period of time. You were like working full time, like during the days as a nurse and then also working like full time a second job as like a cam model and clip producer. Yeah, I would work like a eight hour shift that would often be 10 hours because you can't really leave a, like a nursing job until everything's done or until you get relief because yeah. obviously you can't leave patients without some sort of nurse in place. And so 10 hours I would get home, get on cam by like, I don't know, 1, 1 a.m. and then cam for a few hours and then go to sleep and then wake up, go to my nursing job, <laughs> do it all over again. Yeah. And I did this almost every single day. I would have off every other weekend. Oh, my gosh, that's so rough. <laughs> and I remember, too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's such a wild schedule. And I, I just remember being like, oh, so much work. Um, and we also had a lot of conversations about the similarities between nursing mm -hmm. and sex work, that these are not like wildly different jobs in the sense that both of them require a lot of uh, emotional labor. Yeah, they really do. And it's just something that I was so afraid of letting go of because I thought if I didn't have my nursing job that I wouldn't make as much money or I wouldn't be financially stable. And mm -hmm. at a certain point, I was paying my rent all with my sex work and I was saving up so much money that I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I was so mentally unhealthy working my nursing job and I, I knew it. I would like break down crying all the time. Oh, wow, Even yeah. though I was in therapy, it was just really triggering myself with a lot of the trauma that I saw at work that mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it anymore. I yeah. was not like in a mentally healthy place to be able to care for people that were, you know, dealing with a lot of mental issues and mm -hmm. also health issues and I yeah. did a lot of hospice care and watching people die is not easy, even if, you know, they're elderly. Right. Yeah. I think it's important for people to hear that, though, like, you know, to talk about that process of like transitioning into sex work, in part because like it just feel like the media, it's often portrayed as like, I started an OnlyFans and now I make, <laughs> you know, $10,000 a month. And <laughs> You know, and even for like very successful models, that's often, you know, not how it goes, right? It's it's really, you know, can be a difficult process and you're, you're taking a lot of risk and it's scary to make that transition and it's emotionally taxing, like you said. The transition honestly felt so, it felt so right for me mm -hmm. because I, 
I just got a lot out of sex work that I didn't get out of nursing. A lot of like the environment in nursing, a lot of like my coworkers, they had this entire like sense of self of like, I'm this strong, independent nurse who is emotionally capable of dealing with so much stuff. And, you know, everything is like nurse memorabilia. Like I have like my nurse pin and my nurse bag and my nurse shoe. And I just like never felt connected to that sort of community. Mm -hmm. I never really made friends with my coworkers. And honestly, a lot of them had, you know, like they were really pushing down a lot in order to do this job. And there's a lot of turnover in nursing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, this got really dark. Really no, 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 no. <laughs> it's real. I mean, it's important. I was just so ready to do something else. Like I, I would take like Ubers home from my nursing job when I was working in San Francisco and I would get the, Oh my God, you're wearing your scrubs. Oh my God, you're a nurse. And then like, I get this, like, I'm treated like a war veteran or something. Yeah. And it's so, I'm so strong. Like the, I couldn't do that job. Oh my God. Like, thank you for doing this work because I couldn't do it. And it's like, you could do it. Everyone could do this, but you would just be as emotionally fucked up as I am because of it. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, when, or when I got into camming, like I saw all these cam models on Tumblr And I was like, oh, my God, like, they're so creative. They're doing so much interesting stuff. Like, I miss being that creative person. I miss, like, being seen as the person that's very creative and not just, like, this, like, emotionally strong nurse. Like, I have so many facets to me that I can't express in this job. Yeah. So when I saw that and I was like, oh, my God, I could do that. I jumped on it. I was like anything to get me away from (laughs) all this like trauma like get me away from it tell us a little bit about what your career was like when you just started and where you are now so when I first started I it was really hard because you know when you start on my free cams or something like that they give you the new model tag right and a lot of people are like oh yeah the new model tag will like make you like stand out. Yeah. And people are going to jump on that. And the people that did jump on that were definitely, you know, trying to take advantage of my newness. And, you know, I've been on the internet my whole life pretty much. So I know like how to protect my privacy. I know like about scams and all of that. Like it's not a totally new thing, but, you know, I ended up in a lot of like toxic relationships with clients and, Mm. You know, that is a side of sex work that is definitely a big part of like the, I joined OnlyFans and made $10,000 and now I bought my own house. Like there's also that element that like you're new to this and you think that you need to hold on to every single client that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make money. This person's giving you so much money. Like sure, they call you a whore once in a while when they're mad, but like... (laughs) Right. $500. Like I could handle that. I could do that. And over time I realized I can't do that. That's not enough money. And I started pushing those people away and creating this fan base. That's actually really amazing. My fans are so fucking cool. (laughs) Yeah. That's so nice to hear. Just like me too. (laughs) (laughs) I love the Mm -hmm. (laughs) FBI. So. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of those similar experiences. And I think like most most people do where, you know, these these relationships, especially with like your bigger spenders can become toxic at points. And you get you get in this, I don't know, mind frame where you're like, oh, my God, I can't. What am I going to do? Should I put up with this? Should I have this interaction for the 500th time with this person that's like sucking my you know soul? And I think a lot of other like models help me with this too to realize that I can't continue to do this if there's people who are really like hurting me or dragging me down. Yeah. I relate to that so much. And you know, it it probably took some of the worst clients to yeah. really snap me out of that too. And I had to learn the hard way. I yeah. wish I had more friends in sex work back then that could have helped me navigate that better, but I didn't. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I definitely want to be that person for others. So I talk about it now as openly as I can, like right. that guy giving you $500 so that he can like emotionally traumatize you, like, because he's having a bad day. Right. Once you drop him, you're going to make that times 10 yeah. because you're going to have more emotional energy. You're going to have like the strength to just like do whatever you want. Yeah. And I think that's hard to see, especially if you're new and you don't realize that when one goes, another one comes. And, you know, when you're like, oh, shoot, like I have to hold on to this because what if, you know, a big spender doesn't show up again? Like they always show right. back up. <laughs> oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> and they're going to be there even more when they see someone who is confident in themselves because they're taking like charge of their own career. Right. They're not mm -hmm. letting like all of this toxicity surround them. They're like creating this fan base that people want to be a part of. I think that's really hard. And I think that's something that you have to learn. And the thing that helped me so much was I remember one person said to me, and this is very similar to what you're saying, you're not going to be able to make any money or do this job if you let somebody like kind of pull you, pull you under and like suck your energy and your like joy to do it. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's funny though, because I think what a lot of people don't understand is that like severing those relationships often feels like breaking up with someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It gets so deep yeah. that you don't even realize it mm -hmm. because, you know, you have this idea about sex work. You think that like sex work is such an emotionally detached experience. Right. But really, it's not like you have no. this persona, sure, but like you still have emotions. You still have like that real person inside of you that is creating this persona. Right. And I think it also comes from like this idea of it's like kind of like a whore phobia in a way. It's mm -hmm. like a idea of what sex work is supposed to be. And that is like the guys who buy stuff from you. They're just shitty. That's that's mm -hmm. what they are. They're just shitty. And. You just have to put up with it because that's what's to be expected. You're saying that's like the impression of sex work that comes from like a whorephobic worldview? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's how I went into it. I was like, oh, of course guys are going to treat me like this because this is what I am. Like, right. of course they're mm -hmm. going to. And it was, it was obviously a very toxic right. view of what sex work was. And it's not what I wanted sex work to be, but you know, you grow up like seeing the way that women get treated, seeing right. like all of the jokes about like getting paid for sex or something like right, that. Right, right. And you have this impression of what that makes you now. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone in sex work has to kind of fight back. It's kind of like internalized misogyny in a way. Yeah. Like, right. It's not like that at all. It doesn't have to be like that at all. Like right. you can <laughs> cultivate your fan base. You can create like this wonderful group of people that support you for who mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. And like the kinds of things that you want to do. Yeah. And you know what I found too when I started doing that is that there was a lot of people who were genuinely surprised a, a lot of clients who are generally surprised that I would say that I'm not going to I don't want to be in a relationship with them anymore <laughs> they're like wait but I'm paying you and I'm like yes but <laughs> you, st you still suck and I still don't want to talk to you yeah I found a couple of things happen that sometimes if things get so toxic you just have to like cut people off but sometimes when things aren't working I've also found that if I've said listen like this is not working for me I don't like how you're talking to me or I don't like how you're paying me or I don't think that the terms of how we're doing things are fair then often they're, they'll like take a step back and be like oh I actually didn't know that you felt that way and will totally change the way they're interacting. Exactly. And I've had a lot of fans like that as well. Like they, you know, they have like everyone has like their own personal baggage of right. you For know, sure. how they interact with others. And, you know, sometimes they just genuinely don't know. Yeah. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think, if that's enough to like want to drop them, that's okay. Right. And I think if you want to put that emotional labor into helping them become better people, that's okay too. Yeah. But I know a lot of people that uh, do sex work and they just don't want to be people's therapists. Yeah. And I get that. 
I get that. I get that too. Um, and I think that that's fair because there are people who will do that, you know, that don't mind trying to hold somebody's hand through the process of how to treat somebody that they're in a transactional relationship with. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do that with certain people. Mm -hmm. and others, you know, they just start off in a really bad place and, you know, they just have a lot of their own stuff to work on on their own time. And right. I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. And yeah. if they change and they get better and they can have like a healthy interaction with a sex worker, like I'm happy for them. Right. But I just can't be that sex worker anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was the fact mm. that you do a uh, cosplay because we've never yeah. had anyone on the show who I don't think so. Have we, PJ? Well, We've never really focused on it in an interview anyways. I think we've had a few models on who, who do do some cosplay, but we've just, we've never really talked much about it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you got into that. You know, it's kind of hard to really talk about, like, how exactly, because it was a very organic thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like sewing. I like creating characters. I like doing role play mm -hmm. um, and within sex work I had the experience of people wanting it mm -hmm. people wanting to see it so the demand was there and it was something that I felt I could express creatively and so I did it and it went really well what do you think that when you say that people wanted it, what do you think that they want or what do you think that they get out of it that is different than, you know, if you're not doing cosplay? For me in particular, I like to create new experiences for these characters to be in mm -hmm. that you wouldn't normally see them in. Okay. And I think that particular thing is very exciting. Like, mm -hmm. here's a new story, a new element of this character's experience that you're not going to see anywhere else. So it's kind of like fan fiction in that way. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's definitely like fan fiction, except less writing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less writing. <laughs> okay, so actually that brings up an interesting question. So, like, what does a day in the life of a cosplay performer look like then? So, first of all, I have a kind of rule okay. where I don't do scripts. If someone wants me to perform their script, they're coming to the wrong person. Like, okay. I want to be able to create my own thing based off of, like, a somewhat loose idea of what they want. Mm -hmm. And if I can't do that, it's not very fun for me. <laughs> yeah, so, right. I mean, you've learned that through experience, right? Like you've done strips exactly. in the past. and Exactly. I'm, I'm fine with like reading some lines, but if that's all they want, like I can't have the creative expression. Like anyone could just read those lines. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, part of my thing is I create the fantasy for you based on, you know, my own creative expression. Right. So if that's what you want, then that's why you come to me. If you want someone to just like do a script, then I'm probably not the right person for you. Yeah. So does that mean that you I mean, obviously, I don't think that, you know, every single character, you know, that people are going to come to you with. So does that mean that you have to do research on oh, characters? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like to you know, kind of like embody the way that they express things, like mm -hmm. just like the way that they speak, if they're like a character in like a show or something like that. And I like voice acting. I don't okay. know if I'm particularly good at it, but <laughs> I, I like to, I like to learn accents. I like to do stuff like that. What's your favorite one to do? <laughs> uh... I have been kind of like practicing like a, a Swiss German accent oh. for a character <laughs> from Overwatch. The game? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you say a line or was that embarrassing <laughs> to be put on the spot? I knew we were going in this direction. <laughs> oh, Jesse was spiraling I, I you it. towards this direction. I, know, I feel it. I, 
I oh almost man. died when somebody <laughs> made me do this. So now I feel terrible. I, I don't know if I can. I'm yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> I, have like, um, I have pretty bad stage fright, in all honesty. I feel yeah. the clamming up. Like my hands are sweaty and like my heart is pounding. <laughs> and I'm like sweating profusely and I'm like clamming everywhere. No, don't, like, would, don't, would, don't would do it. Would it help then. if Jesse did a Yinzer uh, impression first? <laughs> oh my God. No, this is why I feel so guilty right now because I was doing an interview one time at the city paper and my boss who was interviewing me was asking me about phone sex and she was like well can you say this phrase in a sexy way and she like slid this envelope over to me and the envelope said yins want to go downtown in at which is like a total (laughs) pittsburgh way to say something but i don't i'm not from pittsburgh so i can't do it and she's like make this sound sexy and i was like there is no way I don't Earth. think I could I can do, do that this. either. <laughs> I don't think I could at all. Holy shit. <laughs> I know. And she's like, just try. Just try. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this. There's no way. I guess we should translate that for our non-Pittsburgh li- listeners. Yeah. That would mean. Uh, do you all, yins? <laughs> do you folks want to go downtown or something or in something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yins want to go downtown and at that. Da- da- I don't. E- I can't even do it. You could do it better, PJ. Eh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no way I can make this sexy, and also I couldn't just become sexy on the spot. Like it has to be organic. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, there's not like a sexy voice that I turn on. It's like you have to get in the mood with somebody to get into something. Yeah, like that. I think. I think maybe if it was like a voice that I feel more confident in, I probably could do it on the spot, but yeah, (laughs) maybe maybe not that one in particular. I, uh, I have to sit in front of a voice recorder for a while and like play it back to myself and like tweak it over and over and over again until it sounds right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. now is a good time to hit the pause button and head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash peep show podcast. Even $1 a month shows us that you care and want to see peep show continue to thrive. Also, you can help increase our reach with a review on iTunes. So, you know, going back to your stage fright, do you feel like being able to create content on your own and produce it by yourself? Has this given you a lot of or a lot of freedom to do things that you would wouldn't be able to do if it was more live or if other people were involved? I definitely think so. When I'm in front of a camera, I don't feel that same amount of embarrassment that I do when I'm I'm like performing for a person. Yeah, yeah. And I've tried to get myself out of that. (laughs) I'm in therapy right now. And part of the thing that I'm trying to do is connect with my inner child. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Sounds so funny to say that. But um, yeah, a lot of that, like a lot of my stage fright experience started like when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Because I I was like really into music. I learned how to play Amazing Grace, like using a mouse. And like on like this little keyboard um, program oh, on wow. my Windows computer. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? Yeah, I was really excited to like do it for like this little talent show in music class. Uh-huh. Because if you if you perform, you get like a lollipop or something. Okay. So I was like bragging about it because I was so happy that I did this thing. And my my music teacher was like, you're lying you can't do that. You're only eight. Like who learns Amazing Grace? Who teaches themselves Amazing Grace when they're like fucking eight? And she like, said you were lying? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I was like, no, I'm not. I was like really like intense about it. And then as soon as I got up to the piano to do it, I choked, completely forgot how to play it. Like oh, it, no. lo- it like left my brain. And I just like started sobbing uncontrollably. Oh, <laughs> oh that's so awful. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty bad. And ever since then, like, I can't speak in front of, like, large groups of people. Yeah. (laughs) I can't do anything. I just start crying uncontrollably. So (laughs) 
And you know what? I was like, I don't want to like be that person anymore. Like, I don't want to have stage fright. I want to like go back to that little girl who was really excited to play Amazing Grace for everyone. Yeah. And so I got a keyboard. I got a digital piano and I'm like oh, cool. teaching myself piano and it's been really good. And That's apparently amazing. it hasn't helped my stage fright quite yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have you back on in a year and we'll see how, how it's going. <laughs> <laughs> That would be great. Yeah, no, that's really great. Do you feel like doing the creative work that you've been doing through sex work has been healing too, in a way? Oh my God, yeah. Just like in all aspects of myself, it's been healing. I can explore different types of like different sides of my sexual self. Yeah. Explore with other people. Mm -hmm. And that's like really great. I love that about sex work. Yeah. And you know, I, I can like create things like making videos is creating something. Right. Making sets is creating something. Yeah. I think a lot of outsiders maybe fail to realize, especially for independent content creators, how, how many different skills that you have to learn and like creatively express yourself, you know, in, in order to put out the content that we put out. For sure. You have to lose that embarrassment. That like mm-hmm. that cringe that you do when you're you watch yourself or listen to your voice or like you're yeah. like, oh my God, why did I do it like that? Why do I keep <laughs> looking at the the monitor instead of the camera? What right. did I stop? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I find that hard actually. Especially with videos. I feel like if mm-hmm. I make a video and I edit it and then put it out into the world, like I don't want to see it again. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like I save all of my raw files and I'm like, one day I'm going to recut this into a different video and it's going to look cooler than the last one. And I have them for years and years. I have like terabytes worth of like all this raw footage (laughs) that I'm literally never going to look at again because I can't mentally handle it. (laughs) (laughs) The same thing with the podcast, although it's a little bit easier with the podcast, but I listen to myself and Last time for the last episode, I was editing it and I was like, oh, my God, I should get a speech coach because it would be easier than editing this nonsense that comes out of my mouth. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always super self-conscious about my California Valley Girl thing that I have going on. I love your voice. Whenever I'm around you, I catch it. Like, I catch your, like, accent. Really? (laughs) I totally do. And I like catch myself like doing your cadence and I'm like, wait, why am I doing that? And I think it's because you sound so cool. So oh, I you're like so sweet. <laughs> I steal it accidentally. You know, I think I was made to feel like that made me dumb when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And so I worked really hard to try to pull out all of the likes that I say, although I've been, it's been a total failure. I still do it all the time, but I (laughs) tried very hard. And I think it was because I was afraid that people wouldn't take me seriously if this is how I talked or I didn't sound smart or I don't know. I don't know where I got this idea that it makes me not smart, but I don't know. I just have to accept it. I like it a lot. One thing I wanted to ask about too is if we can, go back a little bit is uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about platforms. I think you started on a number of different platforms. Um, your career seemed to really have taken off when many vids uh, started maybe, what, mm-hmm. five years ago now or something? I started on my free cams and I did um, some cam shows, but the experience of sitting there with like a quiet room once in a while was mm-hmm. like really devastating. Mm, yeah, it's a hard. It's so <laughs> my hard. Ego. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's not working out. So I went to Chatterbait and I did a lot better on there. I did a lot of like private shows mm-hmm. and that was really good for my income. And then after that, Clipvia, I don't know if you remember this. They terrible, were... awful piece of shit site. Yeah, they, they <laughs> shut down suddenly, right? Yeah, they were actually, I think 
what happened was is they were using like some sort of like venture capitalist person to fund everything that they were doing. And then the money ran out. Yeah. Mm. So they took out loans and the money ran out. And so they stopped paying their models and they still owe me like money. I mean, I'm not going to like lawyer up and go after this company that literally doesn't have any money anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it doesn't actually right. make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then many vids actually caught on to this and they were like, every single model that got burnt by Clipvia, if you come to our site, we're going to give you a bonus, just like free money. Here's free money just for joining. Oh, wow. And so I did. And I got free money. And the platform was amazing. The traffic was amazing. I really love the company in general. Like they're very innovative. And I think they're really good to the models. Mm -hmm. And they're very model centric. Yeah, despite being a company. And they really listen to people. As a result, like they've been my main platform for years and years. And I don't envision le leaving unless they kick me off. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, I can't imagine that happening. <laughs> I've also opened an OnlyFans. I saw now. that. I'm not super duper excited about it because <laughs> they allow chargebacks. Oh, yeah. And I don't like companies that allow chargebacks because that invites a lot of piracy. Yeah, I didn't but... realize that. I have an OnlyFans account, but I didn't know that. And and we know that there's a lot of piracy on OnlyFans. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, Sam Cole just did a, a story in Vice um, that was fairly controversial because it pointed out how easy the piracy is on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, it, it did get a few pirating apps and sites shut down. Like there is an extension for Google mm -hmm. Chrome that people were using. They, all you had to do was install it and it would scrape people's OnlyFans profiles. Yeah. And OnlyFans has exploded as a platform in like the last year, but so too has the, the piracy around OnlyFans mm -hmm. has really exploded. I definitely um, have been enjoying it despite all of the things that I don't particularly like about it. Yeah. But um, yeah, for the most part, it's been good. You know, my personal opinion about piracy is that it definitely fucking sucks and I hate it. And it's like a violation of like my boundaries and obviously my consent. Right. But at the same time, like the guys that, or, you know, anyone, all the people who are going to support my content are doing it because they like me. Right. And right. They're not going to go out there and pirate it. They're not going to do that because they want to support the person that's creating it. Right. So I just try to focus on that and don't let my feelings of that like consent violation really like impact the way that I create or right. continue on in sex work. I was thinking about that today, actually, not particular, not in relation specifically to pirating, but more about the fact that often I think that the transactions or the money that's given for to you by clients or by fans aren't even necessarily for a particular thing. So I think that they'll buy something because they want to support you, not because they it's impossible to find it somewhere else or anything like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's part of it. That's why I kind of think of piracy in a different way than I used to. Mm -hmm. It used to like impact me very strongly to the point where like I didn't want to put out content. I didn't want to put out anything anymore because I knew that someone was going to steal it and some Russian site somewhere was going to be profiting off of right. it. Yeah. And it it hurt so much. Like it really felt like I was being taken advantage of in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I really focused on that negativity and it, it really ate me up. It made me like wonder, like, do I want to continue to do this? Like knowing yeah. that people are stealing my shit and then making money off of it. Do right. I want to do this? Mm -hmm. And I, I almost like really gave up on it because it was too much. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, a lot of the people that support my content, they know how shitty it feels because they follow my Twitter. They see me complain about it. They see me <laughs> sad about it. Like, yeah. And they empathize with that. And they're mm -hmm. like, I don't want her to leave. I don't want her to think that this is the only side yeah. of 
sex mm-hmm. work. Like I want her to know that like I'm a big fan and I don't just say it because I saw like a free video some random place. Yeah. You know, because you know, I actually send her money. Right, right. I support her work. Yeah. Mhm. And want to continue to see her do it. Yeah. All all those fans out there that do that. Um, shout out to you motherfuckers because you're amazing you're the best like you're why I do this you're why I love this do you have like a favorite character or scene that you've done hmm (laughs) a lot of people ask me this and it varies from time to time Mm -hmm. when you interviewed me for your newspaper Mm -hmm. I think I talked about cosplaying as diva from overwatch yeah and the cum bubble yeah <laughs> you did <laughs> yeah i uh i think it was like my maybe second video ever mm-hmm. wow of cosplay. yeah of cosplay. yeah um and i worked with a guy and he came on my bubble gum that i blew <laughs> and then i tweeted it after <laughs> you know, I have to tell you that when I turned that in to my editors, <laughs> my my, uh, my boss was like, wait, what? <laughs> and she was like, wait, she like ate the gum after? And I was like, that's what she said. <laughs> she, she <laughs> those are just, the, <laughs> those are the facts, ma'am. <laughs> just, just reporting the facts. <laughs> And she was like, oh, okay. (laughs) And they, you know, they printed it in the newspapers. (laughs) I love to think about all of the patients that I used to care for when I worked in Pittsburgh. Uh Picking up that article, recognizing me and being like, she was my nurse once. (laughs) And you know what? I'm happy with that. I think I even put in the article that you said it tasted, I can't, now I can't remember. What did you say? Like watermelon, salty watermelon or something? It was musky. Oh, that's right. You did say that. I think you may have written musty. Yeah. But I I think I said musky. Oh. (laughs) Well, sorry. I can fix that. (laughs) We we will uh, reprint this interview on the website, dear listener. We'll switch that So you can enjoy all of the uh, musky details. Yeah, I I don't know. It was like very nice. I love bubble gum. I'm a fan. I love very sweet bubble gum. Yeah. Even though it's like terrible for your teeth and I don't chew it anymore. But <laughs> it was it was very fun. I liked to think of like the wildest experiences that these characters could be in. Yeah. And shortly after that I did uh, Nurse Joy from Pokemon. <laughs> oh really? I remember that. She, That's great. <laughs> she incubated eggs inside of her vagina and laid them. To yeah. heal the Pokemon. Oh. And you know, that makes total sense. And I can't <laughs> believe I'm talking to you about this, Jesse, because this sounds like so not the thing that you do. <laughs> it's like the exact opposite of the thing that I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the Chansey, the, the like Pokemon mm. Center Pokemon has like a little egg looking thing. I don't know if that's supposed yeah. to be an egg. Is it? Is no. it? Is Chansey like a marsupial or is that just like a color I think patch? So. Yeah. I think it is like an egg that it's incubating. Yeah. So it kind of makes I sense. Think. Yeah. And I have no idea what you guys are talking Insofar about. Insofar, bullshit. <laughs> I'm calling bullshit. You have watched like a hundred episodes of Pokemon because we have three children. <laughs> <laughs> and they okay, I have watched... all have gone through well two of them at least went through a pokemon phase and i guarantee the third one is gearing up for it i <laughs> i don't remember who chancy is i'm sorry for yeah. your loss <laughs> you know that's okay no i have to say <laughs> that i can't i have like the exact wrong personality this is why i'm so fascinated by the fact that you uh do cosplay because i have the exact like wrong personality for this because i don't even <laughs> like it's like i can't even wrap my head around it i don't even like halloween because the idea of like dressing up gives me anxiety and i'm like oh my gosh like i can't ima- I-, I don't know who i would be and 
it's very it's stressful. The whole thing totally stresses me out. Well, why can't everybody just be serious and get real? <laughs> What's with all this fantasy shit? Come on. (laughs) I I just can't. And it's so funny that I have this career now where I talk to people about their fantasies all the time because I am not really a fantasy person. I I like fantasies about sex, like, but not Mm. fantasies that include like other props and stuff. I can't deal. I think you're just like a very empathetic person. And mm-hmm. I think you just really love to know what's going on in other people's heads. Well, that's true. I do like, like as that. a result. <laughs> and like, I think that's why you can talk about this stuff, even though it's like not your thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I'm really interested in what other people are interested in. And so I want to know all about that. What were we talking about, PJ, the other day? You said some, we were talking about costumes or something, and but like role playing for sex. I think we must have been watching a TV show. And I was like, oh, would you be into that? And he's like, yeah, I might get into that. And I was like, I could do that. And he laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could, though. I feel like you could be like the sexy like teacher. <laughs> Or the secre- sexy, like, secretary. I could try, We did, yeah. we did a, taxi, a sexy teacher photo shoot we did before, do one. and it came out yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, I, I thought it was hot. People liked it. But, yeah. yeah, so it was funny. I was like, I could do that. We could do that. Right. And he was like, I yeah, mean, right. It also helps that you have both worked as a secretary <laughs> and a teacher. <laughs> right. So these, these aren't... <laughs> you know what? I, I was thinking that as it was coming out of my mouth, and I was like, wait. <laughs> These are roles that are very organic to me. (laughs) Yeah, I remember um, this woman that I went to nursing school with. She always hated it when her husband tried to like sexualize like her nursing job Uh because she was like, oh, yeah, baby, do you want me to wipe your ass for you? Do you want me to get the bedpan for you, baby? (laughs) Like, hold on, let me get my PPE on, okay? (laughs) I can imagine that if you did that all day, you wouldn't want to. It wouldn't be very sexy. I get that. And I mean, like, think about all of the, like, sexual like harassment that goes on being oh, a nurse right. yeah, like, yeah. Totally. Right. I can't imagine I enjoy role playing as a sexy nurse and also as a sexy nurse that heals Pokemon yeah. and has pink <laughs> hair like whatever and lays eggs <laughs> yeah do you have a fucking problem with that <laughs> I didn't think so okay <laughs> I learned from having conversations with you what an ovipositor is I didn't know about that oh before <laughs> Yeah, I really, one of my favorite comments ever is I am on the wrong side of the internet. Like, I get those on my YouTube video. Like, I reviewed, like, bad dragon dildos. Oh, okay. And I often get, like, I'm on the weird side of the internet. How did I get here? (laughs) (laughs) And it makes me so happy. I'm, like, (laughs) I'm, like, opening people's eyes to, like, a whole new world. (laughs) I feel like that could be like a um, a recurring feature on on our website, <laughs> like the the wrong side of the internet. Oh my god, I love that. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> I love that so much. You know, we started this by talking about my favorite cosplay that I've ever done, mm-hmm. and I did um, a character called Samus. Um, she's from this game called Metroid. Okay, and and also features prominently in another game that's very popular right now. Oh yeah, Smash! Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I like to use the like user interface of like the games itself mm-hmm. in order to create this like sexual experience. Huh, and a- you know how like her, I think it's like her gun loads, yeah, it, like loads up. When the dildo is about to come in her, I made this little pixel dildo that's shaped like the one that I'm using, and it loads up on the screen as I'm, like, <laughs> fucking it. And I love that sort of thing. Like, I I got to create this whole, like, pixel art interface that goes along with, like, this video that I made. And <laughs> it's so much fun. I love that sort of stuff. That's wild. It seems like you're, you're really connecting with the media that they originally come from yeah I get really into it (laughs) something clicks and I'm like oh my god I could turn that into a dildo (laughs) 
<laughs> and I have many, many different kinds of dildos. I think I've seen these pictures on social media of your yeah. collection. Yeah, my most recent one that I had made was Job of the Hut um, <laughs> for my Slave Leia cosplay. Uh huh. And that's Star Wars, in case you didn't I know. I knew Jeffy. that. I picked that up. <laughs> Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have I seen Star Wars? Yeah. Um, the... <laughs> I, I can't really. No, we talked about this the other day. I saw the prequel, the first prequel. <laughs> Wait, you you saw the first prequels, but you didn't even see the original. No, how are we married? <laughs> I know how. It's because <laughs> this is how you flirt. <laughs> Get a room, okay? <laughs> I flirt by teasing my wife. Yes. No, I guess that's true. <laughs> I'm a third wheel right now. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think it's very cute. I love <laughs> your relationship. I love all the little quirks that go along with it. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> it's very genuine. We like hanging out with you. Oh, I like hanging out with you. <laughs> I miss you guys. I know. All the time. I miss you so much. We had such a nice time when you came and hung out with us in December. It was so great. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. And I attribute that trip to my new espresso maker that I had oh. to talk about at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We we are so weird about coffee. You know what happened, too, which is funny, is that you bought that. And my mom, when she came to visit, went back down and also bought the same espresso maker. Oh, my gosh. I You're know. like... I should get like an affiliate link yeah, for this seriously? espresso. You really should. <laughs> this is the, it, it's it's an overpriced espresso machine. Actually, I mean it's a it real, is not overpriced. It's really good it value is. for for what it does. Um, but it would take many years of buying cups of coffee to <laughs> equal the take, price. No, of, that's an exaggeration. Really? I, how many years? Oh, it's just like, honestly a couple. No, I think it would take one year. So if you make three cups of coffee a day, which that's I do, like ten dollars or twelve dollars in coffees. Okay, but it's not just coffee; it's espresso. This is some Starbucks level shit. You yeah. can't just get this anywhere. <laughs> right. Like that in itself is like five bucks. Okay, yeah, right. So fifteen dollars. <laughs> and it's better than Starbucks. Just it so. is better than Starbucks. But, uh, oh, <laughs> but <laughs> you're gonna hear from their lawyer after this. <laughs> One of the things I was going to work into this episode is that one of the best things about our friendship is that, I mean, this isn't maybe the best thing about it, but one of the most funny things is that we've <laughs> moved each other five times. Oh my gosh. Every time you bring this up, I <laughs> panic <laughs> because I had this giant couch and I just moved into this place. This is where we were. All of our minds were going. I thought we had to... Push this giant fucking couch up like a flight of stairs in order to get it into my house. Which we but did. Really, we we did all, do this. Almost. It took almost like six of way. us to, and we got it like two thirds of the way up this this steep set of stairs. Oh my gosh, it was so hard. Uh, yeah, it was impossible. And it took like six people because this couch weighed like four hundred. I don't know, four hundred pounds. I, I it, it had a way like half as much as of a car. It was a lot. It was a lot. And we could have just driven it around the fucking back and walked it like didn't PJ, 10 feet. Didn't you walk around the back and like open the door and was like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I feel well, <laughs> so much pain right now. I can feel it. Well, we got two thirds <laughs> of the way up the steps or whatever. And I went and I was like, we should probably check to make sure the path is clear or whatever. So I got to the stop of the steps and I was like, wait, there's a road right there. Couldn't we have just driven? <laughs> and I was like, I don't think you can access that. I don't think we can. I think it's a no access, no, no access road. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that was so funny. The, you know, I, you totally made it up to me, though, because you moved me out of my house when I got a divorce from my last husband mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. showed up there and was moving my bookcases and stuff out while he was standing there staring at us. <laughs> like, that was Am I allowed the worst. to say that he was shirtless? <laughs> <laughs> 
He took off his shirt. <laughs> yes, you can say that. And leaned up against a pole and was like, making sure you knew what you were missing. <laughs> Everyone in that moving vehicle knew what you were missing. <laughs> oh my gosh! This was before my time. I'm just yeah, yeah. Out PJ there. wasn't <laughs> PJ wasn't in the picture yet. But yeah, I don't know how many friends would like move you out of your house when you're getting a divorce. Mm. It's like the wor- most uncomfortable thing. Oh my god, I would do it again and again and again. I I was sad. I couldn't help you the last time you moved. I was like. Would it be weird to just fly there just to help you move? Like I feel like I still owe you somehow for this four hundred pound couch. Well, the the best part of that move before we moved the four hundred pound couch is that you lived in this like loft and mm-hmm. re- remember I came with the kids, PJ and I and mm-hmm. the kids came and we just started throwing stuff off the balcony. Yes. Yes. That, that was, was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was fun. That part was fun. <laughs> it was like, can I throw this? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know the kids were looking at us and they're like, are we really going to throw her stuff down? Yeah, just chuck it. Just chuck it over. The <laughs> yeah. yeah. That yeah was they got fun. into it. <laughs> that was fun. It was it was a lot of fun. And I will always cherish those memories. Minus the couch one, I think. <laughs> I think I the honestly, couch one's a good story. It's I'm really glad you think so. <laughs> we survived. That's true. Yeah, we did. We survived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've we've, you know, been around the block with each other many times. We have. It's been many years. I know. It's weird. It's weird to think that like so much of this, the, some of this stuff happened before I was even with PJ. Yeah. It's nice to see your evolution. Oh, like, does that make sense? Like, <laughs> yeah. Because you the went from academia, you. Yeah. you went to sex work, you left a marriage, you went into a new one. And I don't know, it's just been a very beautiful process to be a part of. Oh. And I really value our friendship. <laughs> Me too. I like any opportunity I get to say that is a good one. I do too. And you've been through like such an evolution too. It's been, it's so nice. It's so nice to have a long-term friend that you go through all Mm -hmm. these different life phases with. And it's so odd that so much of this kind of, I don't know, our life paths kind of overlapped and crossed. It is. It's so odd, but it's like, it's so fun too. Mm -hmm. Like it's so incredible to like be able to share this experience. I think both of you are just like really wonderful people thoughtful people you know to be able to share this experience with you is really like (laughs) a great part of life it's just great (laughs) well this has probably been the most personal interview we've ever done (laughs) it got very real (laughs) it got very real it was really dark for a little while it got deep then it got real and i don't know where we're at and sappy (laughs) then we got sappy yeah sappy (laughs) <laughs> and uh, somewhere in the middle, we were talking about Avi positor porn. Yeah, uh, yeah, laying eggs, like yeah. whatever. Yeah, and so. and musky, musty yeah. gum, and <laughs> and large dildo collections. So, yeah, I mean there was a. <laughs> I think we hit all of the elements of. Right. my existence like I think <laughs> that's perfect we're done here I think so we can wrap <laughs> this up now yep <laughs> well where can people find your work you can follow me on twitter I'm princess purple on there I'm on many vids that's princess purple and I'm on OnlyFans it's princess purple princess purple all around mm-hmm. all around <laughs> <laughs> great thanks so much for hanging out with us i can't believe it yeah. took us um 58 episodes yeah <laughs> but that's kind of ridiculous i'm uh, pretty sure we should we... have waited we should have waited to 69 <laughs> oh what the fuck <laughs> i think we planned to have you on in like episode four so i'm not sure what happened but <laughs> here we are <laughs> And you know well, what? The sound quality is going to be a lot better. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on and hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show podcast. 
I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at PJ Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week.